There we go. We are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you guys for tuning in. I know it's been a long time. We're on a different platform right now. For some of you, some of you, it's brand new. It's a brand new platform. We are on, we're streaming live on Black and Blue on Facebook. We are on LinkedIn and we are on the Black and Blue page on YouTube right now. Okay. And this will be shared across many platforms. Some of you have followed all the way from the, the years of the lab and saw the transition. I told you the transition was coming and we are here. Uh, it's been a, a long time coming, but it came, and I'm excited to bring a special guest to you, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're talking about black and blue. We're talking about law enforcement here in America. We're talking about the effects that it has. We're talking about the effects that it has on people and, and how what, what, whatever questions that you guys have, I want you to bring them to the table. And the special guest I have here it wrote his own book. He's a retired police officer from the L.A. Cowling Sheriff Department. He was with them for uh, 32 years. He's an author. He's an author of this book, which we will be discussing as well. This one right here. I got my copy. Make sure you guys get yours. Black and white and gray all over. With We got Frederick Reynolds here. He's also a United States Marine Corps retiree. Uh, I'm sorry. He, he did three years. I'm sorry. Six years of service in the Marine Corps for all you vets out there. Uh, he talks about his personal life. He talks about experiences. He talks about being on the job. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, after this short break, I will have him here and we will introduce him officially. Stay tuned. All right, just a little video, something new. I hope you guys like this, something that we came up with, uh, just to just to, to break up the levity and to have a little fun. But, but ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm going to bring them to the stage right now. Got Frederick Reynolds back here, and we're going to start the interview. We're going to let it go right now. Here we go. Bam. Fred, you there? I'm here. Perfect. 
Thank you. Thank you for making yourself available. I know we've been talking about this for uh, a few months now, and we're finally here in live and living color to, to talk about some things in law enforcement, to talk about some things in the African-American community, and definitely to talk about your book right here. Thank you for being available. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first of all, I want to I want to thank you for inviting me to, to come on your show. Um, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's something that's necessary. I love the title and I'm 100 percent here for you. 100 percent here for you. I appreciate and, it. Thank you. Just a little background about myself. I'm I'm a 60 year old uh, man, grandfather, uh, nine grandchildren. I have six kids and I'm raising uh, a seventh child, mm -hmm. be 10 years old. OK, I'm married. I was born in Rocky Mount, Virginia. I, I um, grew up in Detroit. My family moved there when I was about three years old. Mm -hmm. so I, um, I grew up in a pretty rough part uh, of Detroit. I got involved uh, with, with a bad element uh, as I was, while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ended up uh, gravitating towards a life of crime and in gangs, and um, I, I ended up dropping out of school and mm -hmm. went to went to juvenile hall. Um, but you know, as I started getting older, and I saw my friends, some of my friends going to prison, and some of them even uh, getting murdered. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't want that for myself, so right. I, didn't, right. I had to get away um, from Detroit. Um, you know, get away from that atmosphere and that peer pressure. So I ended up joining the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I I just happened to be walking down the street one day, you know, actually I was looking for something to steal. Okay. And <laughs> I found myself in front of a, a, a Marine Corps uh, recruiting center. And I said, well, let me go in here and see what's going on. So mm -hmm. went in there, ended up um, joining. I, you know, I wanted to be you know, the tough guy, right? The guy with the rifles. Right. Uh -huh. So recruiter, I want to be that guy on the recruiting post. So who just happened to be a, an infantry man, which is a, a grunt, right? 0311. So I, you know, I enlisted to be, to be in the infantry and um, went in, um, I went to boot camp in California. And okay. uh, I, my first duty station was in Okinawa, Japan. And I was there for about a year. And after I got back from from Okinawa, I was stationed at Camp Pendleton and uh, ended up made, meeting a young lady doing one of our weekend liberty excursions uh, <laughs> in, in Englewood, uh, California at a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And she just happened to be from a city called Compton. I had never heard of Compton. Right. Okay. And, you know, I started seeing her and, you know, ultimately we got married and um, ended up getting out of the Marine Corps. She was pregnant. Um, you know, we, we moved in with her mother in the city mm -hmm. of Compton. Um, you know, the money that I had saved up from the Marine Corps ran out. Her mom was, was charging me to live there. Mm -hmm. And when the money ran out, she told me I couldn't live there anymore. So, you know, I ended up, uh, ultimately I was homeless for a little while, mm -hmm. sleeping in cars and, you know, all night movie theaters, trying to find a, trying to find a job. And mm -hmm. I got across the picket line at Greyhound, worked at Greyhound for a little while. And something happened at Greyhound um, that kind of changed my whole perspective on life. Right. Um, you know, I was a janitor and, mm -hmm. and I unloaded buses uh, in the interim. And, you know, a guy tried to steal this this lady's luggage and she had a bunch of kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just, I just thought it was I just reacted. and I ended up catching a guy and getting her luggage back. And, and mm -hmm. the reaction that I got from her and her kids, um, you know, it, it changed me. Right. When I realized how much I'd, I had helped these people and I had never really wanted to be a cop. But after that, um, you know, I figured maybe I could be one. You know what okay. I mean? Um, you know, it, it's a job it pays the bills. And if I can help people um, like I just helped this lady, mm -hmm. maybe I could. So I ended up um, applying to be a police officer um, for the city of Compton. I got hired and, um, you know, I worked there for the next 14 years. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that was uh, the, the we're, we're going to dig a little deeper in the stories, too. And I know it's, it sounds like a rerun to me because I, I know I read most of what you just explained in your book here. And we're going to talk about that. But uh, I know um, reading your book, 
uh, you talk very vividly and very proudly of your family in North Carolina and, and, and going to go visit them, I believe, on the farm and things like that. What kind of transition was that for you to go from like uh, to, uh, North Carolina to the Chicago area? Virginia. And I know it, it, it gets confusing because there's a Rocky Mountain in North Carolina, too. I'm very familiar with that one. Yeah. Right. right. So, you know, um, that's a that one's a little more well known than the Rocky Mountain in Virginia. Okay. The Rocky Mountain that I grew up in or that I was born in, rather, is in is in Virginia. Okay. And I mean, it was like night and day, you know, from where I was growing up in Detroit, mm -hmm. as far as like hardcore city life. And my family, we would go to Rocky Mount during the summers because that's where all of our family was still living, right? Right. So, you know, I, I I always had this this dichotomy of of, of life or of living um, to experience. You mm -hmm. know, I, I loved going to the country mm -hmm. only for a short while every time, and I had I had great experiences there growing up. But ultimately, I was drawn to the street life in Detroit, okay. you know, mm -hmm. and um, it, it had a real negative effect on me to the point where I had I had to uh, I had to get away. You know? Right. Um, it, it, it was the best decision I ever made because it mm -hmm. you know, it changed my life. So. Right. And I don't want to uh, give away too many uh, gems and pearls that are in the book, but uh, I know um and it is, it is very, I appreciate you being very vulnerable and very honest in your book and, and telling us about your childhood and upbringing. Uh, and I know a lot of people today and or um, in the past can relate to actually not actually being law enforcement per se right now and actually coming up or being around the wrong crowd or doing things that are questionable or doing things that are illegal at certain times in their life to actually maturing and growing and knowing that they have to get out of a certain situation. Uh, you once you explain a lot of your, some things uh, from your past very well to the point where if some a new somebody would read this book now, they could bypass or hopefully bypass uh, uh, doing a lot of similar things that took place. I.e., I know you discuss uh, hanging out with certain friends or going to certain parties or seeing just witnessing certain things in the Detroit area coming up. Right. Right. And and you, I think, you know, later on, after I um, became a police officer, I think it served me well. I think I, that's that was kind of like at the, the crux of my uh, success. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because. I had experienced some of the things that these kids were, you know, were dealing with uh -huh. at the time I confronted them as a law enforcement officer. So I was able to empathize with them and able to give them some guidance. Um, mm -hmm. when needed. And I think a lot of them recognized, you know, a kindred spirit in myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I was successful in some regards, but, you know, other times I, I had to I had to do the job and, you know, some people just refused to listen no matter what. Yeah. So um, it wasn't always, you know, an iron fist that I had when I would police, you know, a lot of times I, I knew how to wear a velvet glove over that fist mm -hmm. and it, to get through um, to a lot of these kids and, and a lot of kids that I probably could have taken off the streets and sent to prison. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted them to to have an opportunity to have a chance to make something better of their lives, uh, much in the same way that I did. Right now, mm -hmm. did I that could I have made mistakes sometimes along the way? Yeah, probably, and I probably did. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think you know the chance that I was able to prevent someone from going totally down the wrong path, uh, I think it was well worth it. Uh, mm -hmm. Taking that chance, so you know, I I, I don't regret any, any anything in any way, um, shape, form, or fashion that I dealt with some of the kids that I had to deal with on the streets mm -hmm. of while I was working. And so, as you stated that you knew you had to get away, and you enlisted in the Marine Corps, and you did six years there. Uh, do you think those years were beneficial, and they helped you from the life that you had beforehand? Oh yeah, yeah, they they were they were definitely definitely beneficial. Um, you know, I was still uh, a knucklehead for the most mm -hmm. part when I went in the Marine Corps and I did some, I did some dumb things in there, but some of the things I did, you know, they didn't rise to the level 
that it affected the type of discharge that I got. I still served honorable, honorably and I got my um, my honorable discharge and did three years uh, active. And then I did three years as an inactive okay. uh, reserve. As a matter of fact, the day that I got my full discharge certificate uh, was was right around the time that I graduated from from the police academy. OK, so it, right. it, it kind of like came full circle, you know, mm -hmm. I remember uh, reading in your book as well uh, after you kind of transitioned from out of being in the Marine Corps and you're living in California and you're working uh, for Greyhound, like you said, and, and something happens where you come across uh, a police officer uh, who was working and interviewed you or talked to you in a way that you said you never had before and you kind of gravitated or emulated to toward that individual. Is that correct? Yeah, that was that was another um, situation. That okay. Made me reconsider the way that I felt toward law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Because obviously the way that I grew up and the interactions that I had with law enforcement as a child um, growing up on the streets of Detroit, they were they were all negative. And mm -hmm. I, to be honest with you, I hated cops, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the cops in Detroit um, were racist. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to keep it 100. They, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were racist. Um, the, the, the area that I lived in, it was predominantly black. And I never saw a black police officer the entire time that I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so this situation that you're referring to, I, I was working two jobs. Okay. And because, you know, working in Greyhound, I wasn't making, making that much. So I got another full time job to, you know, to um, so I could live. Right. And, mm -hmm. and take care of my kids, take care of my family. Um, and a situation happened. I was working as a security guard and, you know, um, the store got robbed and, and mm -hmm. I wasn't there. I was sleeping on duty or whatever, cause I was tired from my other job. And, and, you know, my supervisor was kind of insinuating that I may have been involved in it and knew what happened, but there was a black police officer there. And, um, you know, he talked to me and I told him the truth, what happened that I was tired and I was sleeping and, you know, because I have another job and he believed me. Right. And mm -hmm. the way he talked to me um, with respect, uh, it made me realize that, you know, not all cops are assholes. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse my language, mm -hmm. because I had been accustomed to all cops being assholes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first positive experience that I had with a cop. And then after I, you know, I caught the baggage thief. Mm -hmm. uh, Greyhound, you know, that's when I started having this 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 paradigm shift that perhaps I don't need to be on the wrong side of the law, mm -hmm. that perhaps um, it was OK, you know, to be on the other side. And mm -hmm. that's that's how I started on my path to where I ultimately retired from 32 years later. OK. And because of those experiences, you went through the police academy. Uh, what was your experiences like actually working the job itself? Can you share some experiences, some stories, good ones and not so good ones, things that you encountered throughout the course of a career? Yeah, you know, I worked um, Compton. I started I went to the academy in 1985, in November okay. of 85. And I ended up uh, the L.A. County Sheriff's um, Academy. And okay. I, I graduated. And on Valentine's Day, as a matter of fact, in, in uh, 1986, mm -hmm. and I started working on the streets of Compton. And like I said before, I had never heard of Compton. This is before, you know, Snoop and Dr. Dre and, and all of this. And, you know, um, you know, the, the rap artists, right, the gangster rap artists. So Compton wasn't widely known, mm -hmm. but it was a very, very violent city. OK, um, it was filled with gangs. Um, crack had just started to devastate. Um, our communities and the gang members began selling the crack and making obscene amounts of money. And as a result, um, they had to protect their revenue streams and they started killing each other. Mm -hmm. And when I say they started killing each other, it was a complete bloodbath in that city when I first started working there. So Compton's about 10.1 square miles um, with a population that varied at times of between 80,000, 95,000. Okay. And we, we would average between 75 and 90 murders a year. Wow. So wrap your head around that. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it would be like New York City, you know, averaging 
100,000 uh, or 800,000 murders a year because they've got 8 million people. They, they, you know, imagine New York City with 800,000 murders a year. So that's yeah. what, what, you know, the comparison. That was the comparison. Mm -hmm. So you have this small city and you have this amount of violence um, on a daily basis because there was somebody shot every day. Right? As a matter of fact, to this day, there's not a street that I can walk down in that city where I can't remember a murder. Wow. Not one single street. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of activity there. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I ended up working uh, as a field training officer. I was responsible for training new police officers. Uh, I got chosen or selected to work in the gang unit, which was, you know, pretty prestigious um, assignment because the city was saturated with gangs. And that's where you made your name. Uh -huh. uh, so I became very familiar with with working the gangs, and um, in 1993, as a matter of fact, on today's date in 1993, right? Yep, I, um, it was a, a seminal moment in mm -hmm. my not just my professional life, but in my personal one as well. Um, mm -hmm. That night, two of my colleagues were murdered, and you know, by that time, 1993, I was one of the senior officers, and I was. I was pretty much responsible for a team of officers that our watch commander had directed to go out into the streets and, you know, just concentrate on the gang activity because we had a, we had had an uptick in, in gang related violence, even more so than usual. So we, we were like, we didn't have to answer any radio calls. The only thing we did was we would go out and, and hit the hot spots. And it was a pretty busy night to start off with, but it, it, it quieted down and, you know, I, I decided to get off early because I was seeing someone at the time and I wanted to go, you know, go see her. So I told the team to knock it off, take it to the station and, um, you know, we're done for the night. Mm -hmm. Two of the units, um, they decided to go and eat. Right. Get a, a late code seven. Code seven is our radio code for lunch. Right. So decided to go get a, a late lunch. And I was at the station with another one of the units. And apparently after they ate, um, they got a radio call of shots fired in, a, in an area in Compton. Um, mm -hmm. So they went over there to investigate it before coming into the station. And during the time they're investigating this call, uh, Kevin Burrell and James McDonald, mm -hmm. um, they decide to stop a, a red pickup truck for a traffic violation. And during the course of the traffic stop, they contacted a one of the, you know, a, gang, a violent gang member, mm -hmm. nearby city, and uh, he ended up killing them both. And I was at the station about to get undressed to go see um, this girl mm -hmm. when the over the station intercom, the uh, dispatcher uh, put out the call of, of an officer down. Mm -hmm. I had never heard that. Yeah. Um, right. And but that's the call that no cop wants to hear. Mm -hmm. because cops, we are supposed to be down, right? If a cop right. goes down, that's bad business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, I started put, putting my clothes back on, my uniform back on, ran up the stairs, got with my partner. Um, I'm pulling out the back lot to go to the area where the of the officer down call and the dispatcher updates the call and she says there's two officers down. Mm -hmm. And now I know that. Something horrible had happened when you have two of them down. So I get to the scene and, and you know, I, I see uh, um, the other unit who had went to lunch with uh, Burrell and McDonald. Um, they're blocking off traffic. And I could see on the looks of uh, the, the look on one of their faces. name was Gary Davis. He's one of uh, Kevin Burrell's best friends. They played basketball together. Mm. When I saw the look on his face, I knew something horrible had happened. And he just pointed down the street and I drove down the street and I saw uh, Kevin Burrell. Um, lying in the gutter in front of his patrol car. The overhead lights on the patrol car were on, the spotlights were on, which gave me uh, you know, the indication that they had been on a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no other vehicle in front of theirs. So whatever vehicle they had stopped was long gone. But Kevin was in the streets and uh, in the gutter, and he was suffering from uh, multiple gunshot wounds um, to the head, to the face. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I knew he was dead. Um, mm -hmm. I had seen enough dead people uh, at that point in my career to know. Yeah. And then on the other side of the patrol car in the streets, um, uh, in the street there, were, James McDonald was lying uh, on the street and he had multiple gunshot wounds. One was in his face and mm -hmm. 
I knew he was dead as well. So that Sorry. was that was what I saw that night. And um, <clears throat> um, you know, all, you know, when that happens, the world rolls up. You get cops from everywhere. So I looked yeah. up. I mean, there were a million cops there, wanting to help out. Or police cars from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, they transported my friends um, to the hospital where they were, you know, formally, uh, officially pronounced dead. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had the responsibility of um, securing the crime scene, and I had to write the report. Um, I had to book the evidence, their bloody clothing and badges. And, wow. You know, it's, it, 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 you know, it's just, it just hits in a different way when they're your friends. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Not just people that you work with, but your yeah. friends that yeah, you hang out with off duty and you go over the houses and you, you know, you play dominoes and, you know, um, you play cards and, you know, it, 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 man, it affected me in a horrible way. For a, for a long time because, <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. I, I I took, I, I put the blame on myself. It was misplaced blame, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, I told myself that if I wouldn't have been trying to get off early, you know, for selfish reasons. Wow. They have been there with them and that may not have happened to them. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I just couldn't shake that. And I started drinking um, more than I should have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was a little reckless in, in my personal life. Uh, I was still, I was still like, you know, I just still did a good job at work, but mm -hmm. I was, I was reckless in, in, in my personal life. I didn't, I didn't see my children cause I had, I was, by now I was divorced and I had mm -hmm. two children, um, you know, and they were, they were of age, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't see them enough. So. You know, my, my personal life was was a train wreck because of the accident. And for a while, I didn't even want to be a police officer anymore, man. Um, mm. You know, I did the job because that's what paid the bills. Mm -hmm. and my heart wasn't in it, you know, because, you know, the, those guys that were murdered, um, they were like the best cops. You know, they were good people, good heart. And they treated people well. And Kevin Burrell, everybody loved him. You know, he, he grew up in the city. He was a star basketball player at Compton High. You know, all the gangsters knew him. Everybody knew him. And I was like, you know, it's always the good ones that get killed. Yeah. You know? Um, and and it, it really it, it really had a profoundly negative effect on me. And, you know, I kind of like just drifted along for a little while. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was rough, man. Um, yeah. Even right now, to this day. Um, yeah, I can see. I can see, kind of choking up for it, and, and and I, my 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 condolences and my apologies to even have to relive it and experience it and experience it and go through it the first time. Um, initially, uh, I know when we were talking, you you picked this date specifically for it being the uh, anniversary, um, just so you can memorialize your your friends and colleagues um and with this live and so shout out to them and their families i had to i had to do a lot of healing um clee mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons that i wrote the book um, okay when i when i started uh writing it i knew i had the title for a book i knew that one day i might want to write a book because i always enjoyed writing right mm -hmm. um but i didn't know what the book was going to be about but i knew what the title was going to be about because the title was kind of like indicative of what my life has always been, right? It's, you know, I've always been in the middle, you know, um, I've always lived my life in that gray area. You know, you, you have black and you have white and then you have gray in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I was I was good sometimes, I was bad sometimes, but most of the time I walked in that middle line, which was the gray area. So, you know, I knew that's what, my, what the title was gonna be. So um, once I retired, uh, I wanted to write about what happened that night because mm -hmm. I had I had to do some healing, and and writing about it was very therapeutic. I to believe me. that once I was able to 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 get it out and to admit to myself that you know this wasn't my fault. You know, um, if, if I would have been there, there might have been you know three officers dead instead of two. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so I you know I I had to I had to 
to face that fact that the devil always gets his due. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things that are that that are that happen, you can't always blame yourself for them. And you know, I started writing this book, and 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 it was it was part of a huge healing process. And and then the book just, you know, it just it just grew into my into me trying to heal all aspects of my life. Okay. From, you know, my 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 troubled childhood. Mm. Um, you know, to 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 the to the. To, uh, I'm sorry. To to. Okay. Uh, you know, to the to the personal trauma that I experienced uh, as an adult, uh -huh. and so the book became, um, like I said, therapeutic. It was it was like I was talking to a psychologist, but instead of laying on the couch, I used my keyboard. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it helped me. And when when I finished this book, you know, it felt like that I had given birth. And I know I've I've heard a lot of women say that before, you know, and, and it's like, oh, what do you mean? It felt like you get. That's I I I understood what they were saying. I understood the metaphor once mm -hmm. I finished um, writing this book, and you know um, a, another part of the healing was I got freeway memorial signs um, in the officers' memories mm -hmm. after years. You know, for some reason, you know, no one had ever acknowledged them, their mm -hmm. deaths that they were heroes. So I took it upon myself to draft a resolution to take it to Sacramento, the California capital, and present it um, to get a resolution drafted so that we can get free mem freeway memorials for these officers. And, you know, I, I got I got that approved, not just for Kevin and for Jimmy, but also for another officer uh, who was killed in a traffic accident, you know, before I even got hired. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that for him as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once that was done, I felt like I had truly, truly unburdened myself. You know, I, I didn't have a cross to bear anymore. You know, um, I was healed. And um, that's why I feel the way that I feel now. That's why I chose this day to mm -hmm. talk about um, this, because it affected so many people um, in, you know, just horrible, horrible ways. Because like I said, these guys, was they were such good men. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing. I know it wasn't it's not real easy to share. And, and I, I I can empathize, knock on wood. I, I haven't experienced uh, uh, the loss of a, a colleague or friend. I don't want to. Um, but to actually go through it, I know it is not a fun or easy task. So I commend you uh, on the work that you for actually going through it and the work that you did uh, to heal and to be, again, vulnerable enough to actually put the pen to paper and put it in the book. It uh, memorializes them and, and it puts your words down forever. Every every your story will live on for forever. Uh, somebody else will pick up the book and they'll learn from from you the uh, the words that you put in there. They'll learn about them and how important they are to you and still are. Thanks, Clay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, a lot of stories come through um, while working on the job, uh, and, and a plethora full of them are in this book right here. Uh, how long did it actually physically take you to write the book itself, and to kind of get your thoughts together and remember so many things? Um, well, a lot. I, there's a a lot of historical references in the book, and mm -hmm. I was able to get a lot of that information because um, the book also also talks about um, the end of the Compton Police Department. Mm -hmm. okay? So the Compton Police Department was a, a, a law enforcement agency that had been in existence for, in existence for over 120 years. And in 2000, um, they were taken over by the LA County Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a lot of politics going on. Um, so I, I became a member of the LA County Sheriff's Department in 2000. And um, so the book talks about, you know, why that happened. It mm -hmm. talks about, you know, the entire transition. There was a narcotic investigation mm -hmm. um, that was at the, at the center um, of- Yeah, of I read that. Police. I thought it was interesting in itself. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. And, you know, I was, um, I was responsible for that investigation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is a whole nother story the way it, that almost, um, you know, tore my family apart, affected my family and 
and me personally. But yeah. to answer your question, how long it took me to, to write the book, um, like I said, I had been gathering this historical information because after I went to the sheriff's department, um, I, I went to the homicide unit. So I, I, as, as a homicide investigator, I, I had access to all of the murder books. So okay. I was able to, to go through all of the Compton PD murder books. And it was like 1,400 murder books that I was able to, you know, to just peruse and, and, mm -hmm. and get historical information from. Um, and, I, and I saw that a lot of cases were, were very interesting and, and had some historical significance um, in regard to what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a lot of information that I used to, to fill the book. And I, I just kept notes of it during the time that I was working. Mm -hmm. when I, I retired on, in November of 2017, and that's when I actually picked up the pen or, in this, in this case, you know, opened up the computer, the laptop, and started putting my thoughts to paper. Um, okay. these notes, um, I had the title in mind, yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I wanted the book to, to center around Kevin and and Jimmy, the, the murders of Kevin and Jimmy, which is why I start off with that in the prologue. Mm -hmm. So I was writing the book. I was doing well. Um, and I would print out, you know, what I had typed up during the week. And I, I had picked up a post-retirement job. I was working for a guy by the name of Clarence Avon, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's the black godfather, real, real uh, popular, famous heavyweight okay. in, the, in the black community. Mm -hmm. And so I was his bodyguard and his driver. So I would take the paper, the, the um, what I had written with me, and I would proofread it in his driveway with a pencil, right? While I was mm -hmm. waiting for him to, while he was waiting for me to take him places, you know, when I had downtime. So I did that for a little while, and I, I was working my way through it, and then I had a heart attack, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. in, in April of 2020. Okay. And um, I almost died, and. I had I had emergency surgery, which is another thing that you know when we talk about law enforcement, the stress, you know, mm -hmm. when you you work as a cop, a lot of cops die within five years of retirement, right. you know, just based on a, the accumulation of stress mm -hmm. through through you know all these high powered mm -hmm. situations that we deal with for for years and years and years, and damn if it didn't happen to me. Well, I had a heart attack three years after I retired. So, you know, and, and it happened right during COVID. So mm -hmm. I couldn't have visits. My right. wife couldn't come see me. I'm mm -hmm. in the hospital room alone, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I didn't have a phone charger, so I couldn't talk to anybody. So I'm just in there, you know, and with, along with my thoughts. And I started thinking, I said, well, I've been working on this book and I almost died. What, you know, what if I would have died without finishing what I was trying to do? So I made a I made a commitment. I made a promise to myself. I said, if I get better when I get out of here, I'm gonna finish this book. I'm gonna nonstop mm -hmm. book. And when I got out of the hospital, I went home. I sat down and I just I finished it, right. So, you know, that was a, a long explanation for a short question. <laughs> it took about two and a half years, okay, gotcha. for, for me to start getting serious about it until I finished it. So. I understand why it was a long explanation. No, no need to apologize or none of that. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and I know we talked about the uh, the title. Um, how, how do you think your the title or the book is perceived uh, uh, throughout through the cultures, whether it's white, black, or indifferent? Well, you know, it's um, the subtitle of the book is. Um, I mean, the, the title "Black, White, Gray" all over it is what it is, but the mm -hmm. subtitle. I think is where some people might have some angst mm -hmm. uh, regarding that, right? Because it's it's a black man's odyssey in life and law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Clay, you know, there is a difference mm -hmm. in this country. My journey, our journeys are different mm -hmm. from someone else's journeys. Right. Okay? It mm -hmm. just is what it is. I don't care whether it's right, wrong, or indifference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just calling it like I said, it, it's, it's different. Right. And I wanted the reader to be able to walk in my shoes and to see what that journey was like, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just as a law enforcement officer, but as a black man growing up or living in America. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this country. There is no uh -huh. place I would rather live 
in my life. But we have historically, we have had problems when it comes to race relations and we got to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. My book, my book is, is um, kind of like a recipe for how we can, you know, make inroads to fixing those relationships. Mm. So, you know, to use a, an age old, age old uh, adage of not judging a book by its cover, <laughs> you can't judge my book by its cover. Because just because I say it's a black man's odyssey in life and law enforcement is so much more than that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I believe that we all have to come together. I believe that we're all brethren and, and we all got to have serious conversations. We got to come together. We got to fix this shit because this is all of our countries. Mm -hmm. my, I have grandkids. My grandkids are half white. I have grandkids that are half Mexican. I have a grandkid that is a half Filipina. Okay. My home is a melting pot. Mm -hmm. My home is what America is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, um, that is what we have to learn. That is what we have to understand. So the white police officers that might have reservations about reading my book because of that subtitle, you know, thinking that, oh, here we go again. Another story about, you know, about blackness. And, and, you know, there are people that say that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not what you think it is. It's something different. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it plays you know, a part towards the other end of the spectrum as well. When, when we're talking about people that of color, that might read the book that have an aversion or, or dislike for law enforcement, right? The, the people that say, I'm not going to read that book, a, a cop yeah. wrote it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a bridge between the culture of policing and the culture of the inner city, mm -hmm. because we have to come to an accord once we can't we can't fix this unless one side knows how the other side feels mm -hmm. and vice versa mm -hmm. because law enforcement we are your mothers we are your fathers your brothers mm -hmm. your sisters your aunts uncles cousins you know we're your sons and daughters right yeah um, i might be standing behind you in a grocery line or i might even be standing behind you in a medical marijuana dispensary and you not even know who i am right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're all of one accord Right. I just had a different job. I had a job that sometimes I had to tell people what to do who mm -hmm. weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And, and we have to have that in our society if we're going to have a viable functioning society. Right. But at the same along those lines, police officers have to respect the people that we're charged with taking care of. Mm -hmm. OK, we don't get to we don't get to pick and choose the type of people that we care for. We mm -hmm. don't get to pick and choose the type of people that we take care of. We don't get to pick and choose the type of people that we provide service to. We mm -hmm. provide service to everyone until they show us that they're trying to impede the service that we're trying to pro provide to others. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And that, trans that transcends colors. Mm -hmm. So until law enforcement officers learn how to police crime and not culture, Mm. we're going to have a problem, right? Because there is a difference. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cops don't they haven't understood that. Um, and what's probably even worse, that they, they won't even take the time to try to understand it. Mm -hmm. But unless we do, um, we're going to have a really bad situation. And, and that's why we've come to the point that we are in this country right now. All right. All right. Thank you for sharing. And I know um, your book, you, we were talking off camera behind backstage uh, before the live actually got started. Uh, your, your books received many accolades from uh, many different uh, installations or institutions. I'm sorry, uh, institutions of uh, different companies and different people from all walks of life. So it, it is it is hitting home. Uh, people are recognizing it and people are commending it for its fine work. Uh, like I said, uh, I, I, I I said this behind the stage. I wish I would have read something like this when I was uh, a newer officer, when I was at least the year anywhere from year one to five. Honestly, I said three to five before, but year one to five, because you, I, I could have learned so much through your eyes or just through your experiences on uh, uh, just working the job itself on on types of encounters I could potentially have or just handling uh, a 
handling myself in a professional atmosphere, relating to someone who wasn't, who didn't grow, who didn't grow up and actually want to be a cop, but just, you explain how situations influence you to go that way, and things uh, also understanding how things affected you personally. Because uh, I know a lot of times, a lot of people, like I told you before, see us as one way. They see us as one sided. And, and if they see us while working, they only know the police version of you. They only know you to be who 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 they think that you are. And, and not like you said, where somebody's sons, fathers, grandfathers, where, so, where people out in the community where we, we care about society, we care about the individual person. So and they, I think bridging the gap like you said goes a long way with understanding the whole person on both sides yes absolutely absolutely so your book where where if someone wanted to get a copy of it where is it actually available i know we have the uh website posted right here and it'll be posted on in the uh, comment section as well but uh what, what platforms can it, people individuals get a copy of your book um you can get um the book at amazon you can mm -hmm. get it at at uh, BAM, um, which is Books a Million. Mm -hmm. um, you can get it at Target, and you can also get it at Barnes and Noble. Okay. So you're, you're multifaceted. You're on multiple platforms. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, have you gone anywhere? Have you had a book signing, or do you have any? Um, do you go, go anywhere and actually uh, talk about your book to uh, a, a group of people or anything like that? No, I um, unfortunately with with this COVID nineteen COVID nineteen madness, um, it's it's put a damper on a lot of um, activities like that. I had one book signing um, with a with an author by the name of uh, Danny Smith. He was a L.A. County Sheriff's homicide investigator. He's written a, a, a bunch of books. He's a fabulous writer. Okay, um, about law enforcement. Um, Danny Smith. He's written maybe six or seven books. Um, he and I had a, a joint book signing. Um, together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I took 30 books with me. I sold all of them. So, um, you know, pe people, people are excited. Mm -hmm. about it. And, you know, I guess what I'm most surprised about is uh, the white readers that mm -hmm. are buying the book. Um, you know, um, liberals, I should uh, say. Okay. People that you think wouldn't want to read about uh, mm -hmm. law enforcement. So uh, maybe the title was, is working, um, you know, <laughs> in, in, in an odd uh, backwards kind of way, uh, bringing them in to, to uh -huh. purchase the book. Maybe they want to find out, you know, what's going on with, with law enforcement from a black perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope uh, they're learning a lot when they read it um, and, and learning that everything that you think is isn't. Hmm. All right. All right. Uh, and before we start wrapping up and all, all that, um, what, let me ask this question. I did a town hall uh, back in um, November where I spoke to a group of high school age students. And surprisingly, uh, it, well, the, it, it was a good interaction. But surprisingly, one of the questions that uh, some of the students in the classroom had was what they could do or what, what things they should expect or how could they start making uh, steps toward becoming a police officer. They wanted to know. Can you tell us some of the pros and cons uh, on uh, it's coming into this profession or would you suggest it or would you uh, uh, condone actually a high school age student wanting to grow up to be a police officer and how important that could be? Oh, yeah, it's it, it's everything because we're going to need it. Um, like mm -hmm. I said, you can't have a viable uh, functioning society without some kind of law and order. Uh, so so we're, we're going to all there's always going to be a need for that. And, but we need we need good, strong, smart, ethical people mm -hmm. to fill those positions. Uh, we need people that are compassionate, but yet strong. Uh, so if, if, if you're young and you want to do that, you know, you have to make sure you stay out of trouble. You know, mm -hmm. don't choose the path that I chose. Uh, make sure you stay out of trouble. Um, if you do start to go down the wrong path, though, you know, make sure you talk to somebody, get some help. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to a police officer because, you know, believe it or not, cops are they want to help you. OK, mm -hmm. they would much rather deal with you when you're on at the crossroads than have to deal with you once you've once you've chosen the wrong path. So right. it, it, it's OK to try to get some advice from a police officer if you think you, if you're thinking about um, taking the wrong path. Um, otherwise, make sure you, you stay out of trouble. 
keep your keep your credit your credit good, which you know is is one of the the the, the processes of, of a successful background. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it affects you know some people adversely. Uh, you know, because it, just because you run into some problems with credit doesn't mean that you'll be a bad police officer, right? Mm -hmm. They, they kind of they used to use that as a gauge to whether you're going to be a responsible individual. But you know, I, I I don't I don't agree with that. Right. But you know, you you should try to keep your credit um, score good, um, and just you know stay out of trouble, keep a good driving record, mm -hmm. and you know if if you want to be a cop, God bless you. God bless mm -hmm. you. It's a calling, though. It, it, you know, it's more than just a job because you can die out there. Mm -hmm. Yep, you absolutely can. It's a it's a real world job. It's a real world occupation. Uh, I remember uh, one of my uh, older police officers when I first started said, uh, "This job is a meat grinder." It's going to chew you up. Uh, it's a lot of fun in the process. And you got a front row ticket to the best seat, uh, the best show on earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're going to help a lot more people than you hurt. Yep. Yep. I know we talked about a lot of things and we discussed your book. Uh, I, I don't want to get too deep into the book because I still want to leave a little suspense for the viewers to actually go, go out and, and get their own copy and dive into it so they can digest uh, all the, the gems and pearls that you put into the book itself. But is there anything that we skipped or is there anything that you would like to say right now? The floor is yours. No, I, I, I think you pretty much covered it all, Clee. Um, I, got, I got a chance to... Um, to talk about um, the murders of my friends, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, you 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 spoke very nicely uh, about my book, and and I appreciate it. Um, I think that that the book is will be helpful for not only law enforcement but for other people that want to understand what goes through the mind of a law enforcement officer. And, you know, the day to day rigors of the job uh, of a law enforcement officer, particularly uh, uh, of a black law enforcement officer, because, you know, that, that, like I said earlier, that journey is different. But when you when you're a black law enforcement officer, it doesn't even matter when you're at work. OK, because no matter who you work with, you'll 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 sacrifice your life for them. Mm -hmm. because that's the job. And, you know, we protect each other. We love each other when we're working. We'll lay down our lives for each other when we're working. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that for the most part, the people, men and women in this country feel like that, regardless of their professions. But we have to, we have to have an accord. We have to come to an accord rather. And we have to, we have to work out what's going on um, and, and this country, as far as the division is, is concerned, mm -hmm. because there is a problem, um, that much is, is crystal clear. Um, but there's a problem on both sides. And, uh, until we're able to recognize that and understand that and understand that we're all the same, regardless of race, creed, or color, um, we're going to have problems. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I talk about Martin Luther King and, and, and my book, I, you know, one of the best things that he ever said was, you know, it's all about the content of your character. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's what matters. And if we can start looking at each other, you know, as far as each other's character, we'll go a long way toward healing the divide. There we go. There we go. Good words, good words. This has been a good lie. I learned a lot. I know we uh, spoke briefly um, beforehand and we've been communicating uh, via um, messenger or text messaging before the live. Uh, it's nice to officially meet you and get hear you, your story. Nice to read your book. Uh, I, I felt like I, I told you once I completed your book, I said, wow, I feel like I actually know you and I haven't even met you. You know, it's, it's impactful and it's important. Uh, thank you for coming on and blessing this show and, and explaining your side of the story and giving your viewpoints. And you did a tremendous job. And I, I appreciate everything that you have done and, and are doing. Thank you, Clay. And you be safe out there, man. 
All right. Thank you. I will. I will. And, and again, uh, I, I'm honored to go live with you to comm comm commemorate uh, the memory of your colleagues and friends. Thank you. Absolutely. Make sure you guys tune in for more. Uh, make sure you guys check out his book. The, the website's here. It'll also be in the comments section. Make sure you guys get your own copy. It is worth the read. You will definitely learn something and it is very impactful. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're out of here. Peace.